and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's How Did We Get Here show. I am the host, DeSoto Brown. I am the Bishop Museum historian for Bishop Museum here in Honolulu, and I'm also the curator for the archives at Bishop Museum. And I'm going to be talking about something today which is uh, near and dear to me, as I'm about to tell you. But also, I just want to say that uh, everything that you're going to be seeing in this presentation today comes from my personal collection. It is not part of the Bishop Museum collection. So today I'm talking about the rise and fall of a major local Hawaii corporation. And that was the Spence Cliff Restaurants. Spence Cliff Restaurants, for anybody who was here in Honolulu from the 1940s into the 1980s, was a very well-known presence. Uh, many of us dined at Spence Cliff Restaurants. Many of us were aware of Spence Cliff Restaurants very successful corporation and yet today it's completely gone so i want to not only tell you about spence cliff and show you a number of the restaurants and if you're old enough you'll remember many of them where did spence cliff come from well there were two brothers who started this entire organization and they were spencer weaver known as spence and clifton weaver known as cliff they were born in new york and they both visited the hawaiian islands for the first time when they were young in 1929, while they were on a trip with their parents, with their family. In the 1930s, both brothers joined the military, and Spencer was in the Navy. And in 1936, he was posted here to Hawaii for the first time. When he got out of the Navy after four years in 1939, he returned and he started a restaurant chain. In 1940, his brother Clifton came, and they both worked on the restaurant chain, and it was their names put together, Spence and Cliff, that created the name of the restaurants. Their first venture was this one. This is something called Swanky Frankie, which was a franchise that sold frankfurters, otherwise known as hot dogs. Swanky being a word of the time, meaning very wonderful. And in addition to purchasing an existing drive-in restaurant in Waikiki and renaming it the Swanky Frankie Drive-In, they also had six stainless steel frankfurter carts that could go out and sell hot dogs and also they had a fleet of these little mini cars that you see in this picture here taken in 1940. this is a brand of car called a crosley kind of a mini car that was sold in the united states from the 1930s into the 1950s and if you look on the side of this swanky frankie mobile uh, written on it, it says swanky hamburgers, ice cream bars, Coca-Cola, orangeade, root beer, coffee, and cigarettes. Well, this is parked on Kalakaua Avenue right next to Kuhio Beach. And these three women, as you can see, in their bathing suits have just come right off the beach to buy something from the Swanky Frankie Mobile. Well, at the end of 1941, even though by now uh, Spence Cliff did have more than one business going here, that's when the war started for the United States. Both of the Weaver brothers got put back in the military, back on active duty. Spence Cliff wasn't doing very much during World War II. But when the war ended in 1945, they got back into business and in a very big way. I'm now just going to go through some of the Spence Cliff restaurants in chronological order. And the first one is the Sky Room at the original Honolulu Airport. So these two images on the left, that's the control tower of the original Honolulu Airport that used to be on Lagoon Drive, and it was built during the war by the military. It was turned over for civilian use after the war. And in 1948, the Spence Cliff restaurants opened a restaurant in that terminal, which, as you can see, was called the Sky Room. And what happened to the Sky Room? Well, let's look at what happened. This is what it was like. The Sky Room had two levels, and this is something we're going to see again and again in Spence Cliff restaurants. In the same location, two different floors and two different restaurants. The ground floor was a coffee shop where you could get quick food, but the second floor was a fine dining restaurant, and it had expensive food, as you can see from this ad. It specialized in flaming sword meals, steaks, exotic foods, impeccable service. Now you're thinking, why would there be a fine dining restaurant at an airport? Well, at that time, there was no airport security of any kind. You could just park your car and walk into an airport and go anywhere that was publicly accessible. So people did, in fact, drive to the airport to go to this restaurant. But what they also did 
was to go to the airport and see people off because you could literally go right up to the gate in those days with somebody if you chose to. So people would go early to the airport. And as you can see in this picture, this is taken in the, um, in the Sky Room restaurant. The people, the, you see four people wearing lay, <clears throat> excuse me, those, that's a tourist family that is about to get on an airplane and leave. And the other people are there to see them off. And people would go in and have cocktails as these people are doing before some friends left on a plane. Now we're gonna move forward to another famous restaurant in its time. This was the Queen Surf Restaurant and Nightclub. And this was located at what is now just an open beach park, also called Queen Surf, at the base of Diamond Head, which is of course completely open and there's no building left there. But originally the Queen Surf building had been the mansion of a very wealthy couple uh, built in the 1920, in the teens, I should say. Eventually after World War II, the second owner died and uh, a group of investors got together, bought the property and remade it into a big restaurant and three different bars. And that's what this, these pictures are of. One of the bars on the left and the dining and dancing area, which was on the ground floor. Well. Unfortunately, this first version of Queen Surf was unsuccessful. It lost a great deal of money in its first year and a half, over $100,000. That was a fortune. So from 1946 onwards, it was clear that it wasn't going to succeed. In 1949, the Spence Cliff restaurants bought the lease, and then they redid it. And it was then quite successful under the successful guidance of Spencer Weaver primarily. In 1958, in the Queen Surf, a separate bar was opened called Barefoot Bar. Very famous, very well known, very popular in its time period. Uh, it was uh, overseen by a man named uh, Sterling Mossman. Sterling Mossman had started out as a police officer and then became an entertainer. And the Barefoot Bar was famous for not only a lot of local people going there, including Beach Boys, but also a number of celebrities came to the Barefoot Bar too. One of the most successful aspects of Queen Surf was the weekly luau. And this was a huge affair. And as you can see in the picture on the lower right, hundreds of people would attend each time. It was held every Sunday all throughout the year. But then in during the summer, when there were more tourists, they also staged it on Thursday nights as well. And as you can see by the ticket, which is reproduced here from 1967, in order to make sure everybody got a place, you had to have an assigned seat among these other hundreds of guests who not only came to see the whole ceremonial on taking the pig out of the emu, cutting up the pig, serving it to people, and a lot. there was a whole stage show as well. It was a whole spectacle staged for tourists, and it was very successful. And also among the many other performers who were there at Queen Surf, and I'm saying all this to tell you how Spence Cliff adapted to what the public wanted and needed, adapted to what they could successfully stage for people, and to take something that wasn't successful, Queen Surf, and turn it into something that really was. So during the 1960s, another one of the shows at uh, Queen Surf was this one. It was called Puka Puka Otea, and it was a Polynesian show with songs and dances of Tahiti, Samoa, and Robert Tonga. And again, a personal memory, I live not too far away from Queen Surf. Well, pretty far away, but sometimes as a kid, I would wake up in the night and hear the Tahitian drums from the Puka Puka Otea show because it was staged three times a night, 9.30, 11.30, and 1.20. And it was partly outdoors at the Queen Surf Garden. So that's why I could hear those drums. And I'd wake up as a kid and think, two o'clock in the morning, who is out at a bar listening to these Tahitian drums? Well, the next decade, I gradually understood staying up late and going out and doing things like that once I got to be old enough. Anyway, 1951, opening of Kelly's Drive-In Diner. This was on Pu'uloa Road near uh, Kamehameha Highway, and they refer to it as being near the airport because the airport at that point was on Lagoon Drive not too far away. 
This was called a drive-in diner because it was a combination of a drive-in in which car hops came to your car and served you food and a sit-down restaurant indoors. Now, since the 1970s, there's been a cliche of the 1950s as being represented by a car hop on roller skates coming out to your 50s car at a drive-in. Well, that really happened at Kelly's Drive-In. The car hops really did go around on roller skates. Uh, the following year, 1952, again, adopting to something which was popular and giving something that people wanted, Kelly's Bowl opened. It was a bowling alley that opened as part of this complex. Bowling was very popular during the 50s and drive-ins were very popular in the 1950s. Spencer Weaver is on top of this and he gives people what they want. Uh, Kelly's Bowl, there's Kelly's Bowl, excuse me, I talked about it a little too soon, but uh, Kelly's Bowl was there from 1952 till 1968. And what I also want to point out is Spencer Weaver was able to adopt to things and drop them once they began to lose popularity. So Kelly's Bowl got turned into the Spence Cliff Restaurant accounting office in 1968 once the interest in bowling started to taper off. So what did Kelly's also offer? Well, this is something else that, that I admire Spencer Weaver for. He jumped on things again. I, I, I'm sure he was very, key, he, I'm sure he must have kept up with trends in restaurant, in the restaurant field. He must have been a subscriber to trade magazines because you very frequently see him offering things that, again, are sort of trendy that are going to take off with people because it's a fad at the time. During the 1950s, flying saucers were a big deal. There were a lot of science fiction movies about aliens and flying saucers. Well, here's the flying saucer sandwich, which was made in a special kind of a, uh, almost like a waffle iron, I think, that clamps shut. You put two pieces of bread, you put the filling inside, it clamps shut, it cooks it, it toasts it, and then you got a flying saucer sandwich. And I want to point out that that costs 40 cents. That's, <laughs> that's a bargain. <laughs> So in 1959, uh, Kelly's opened with a bar, and Spencer Weaver was very clear on, again, giving people what they want. Whenever he opened a restaurant, he opened a bar along with it. Why? Because people like to drink, but also because you make good money from selling cocktails. The alcohol that's in a bottle, a bartender pours it into a glass, and suddenly it's worth a lot more money, and you can get more money for that. So... It was necessary for the liquor license to be renewed for Kelly's. The Honolulu Liquor Commission would not grant a liquor license or would not renew the license of a drive-in restaurant. So it was necessary for Kelly's to stop being a drive-in. Uh, they dropped all of their car hops. And that way they were able to renew their liquor license for the indoor seating area. But at the same time in 1959, they also built a separate drive-in under a different name called Hamburger Heaven. So that way they were still able to provide drive-in patrons, but disassociating that restaurant from the rest of Kelly's that had a liquor license. And as you can see, they're advertising Hamburger Heaven as a 24 cent hamburger. At that time, a lot of the drive-ins were competing with each other to cut prices of hamburgers. And there were others that sold them for 20 cents each, five for a dollar. By dropping the price one cent from 25 cents to 24 cents, now you've got something that you can advertise and hopefully attract more people to because you're offering something cheaper. Next is Fisherman's Wharf, and this opened in 1952. There already had been a restaurant at Kewalo Basin, which at that point was where all the fishing boats docked. It's also where the tuna cannery was. And the former Felix's Florentine Garden was gardens, was bought by Spencecliff, turned into Fisherman's Wharf. And the one-story building was then enlarged in 1959 to have a second story on top. So you see two images here. The one on the top is the original one-story building, and the one on the bottom is the second story after it had been added. And typical for Spencecliff, and I've already mentioned this once, once there were two floors to a building, once it was possible to differentiate one type of restaurant from another one. He then claimed, Spence said, okay, we've got two restaurants in one building. 
So this matchbook shows you that Fisherman's Wharf on the, quote, main deck, meaning the ground floor, has the Seafood Grotto and the Snug Harbor Bar. The second floor, or second deck, has Captain's Bridge and Mermaid Bar. And again, one building, but purportedly two different restaurants by the way Spence Cliff uh, treated them. Another clever thing Spence Cliff did, other people will remember this along with me, kitty menus that looked like masks. They were printed on paper. They had holes that you could look out through with your eyes, and you were allowed to take that paper mask home with you, in which case it now continues to promote the restaurant. So here is one of the paper masks that was used at Fisherman's Wharf, and it's supposed to look like the helmet of a traditional deep sea diver garb, which you use to go underwater. This is before aqualungs were invented. And that's the front on the left. And on the back, you can see this is labeled the little pirate's menu for Fisherman's Wharf. Spencliffe didn't create these from scratch. There was a company that provided them to, to restaurants, whoever wanted them. But again, it shows you thinking of how do you get people to remember you and how do you get people to come back? You get to the kids, the kids will want to come back. Also at Fisherman's Wharf, there was a treasure chest, so-called. And if you were under a certain age, at the time your parents paid the bill, you could take a little wrapped gift out of the Fisherman's Wharf treasure chest, which I did more than once. Now, here's a saga of one restaurant that Spence Weaver is saying we need to adopt and adapt to what's going on in order to keep this restaurant functioning. It started out as the Gourmet Restaurant, opening in 1953 in Waikiki, in what was called the Royal Block, which was a retail space. And in the picture on the right, you can see the, the sign for the Gourmet Restaurant. And the Gourmet was, as it said, a fine dining restaurant. The entrees were expensive, and there was a very extensive menu of many different things which were offered. So this was successful, start, you know, as I said, in 1953. But in 1962, Spence said, look, we're no longer getting the types of tourists we did before who had a lot of money and who would pay a lot of money. Because in the 1960s, as jet travel took over, more and more economy travelers began to come here and more hotels opened with lower rates, and it was much cheaper to get here. So in order to keep this place going, it dropped the entire gourmet menu, and it was retitled Waikiki Prime Rib. And it went from an extensive menu to serving one thing, roast beef. And that's all you could get. And your only choice was to ask for a thick slice or a thin slice of roast beef. And there were some other side dishes that you could purchase separately. By this, by doing this, Spence Cliff cuts its costs tremendously. It cuts the number of workers tremendously. And it keeps this place um, competitive in an increasingly expensive Waikiki. And you'll notice that the even though the, the names have changed and the what they're offering has changed, that striped awning is still there as a distinctive memorable, notable part of that restaurant so that people remember it. And then in 1967, another change occurred and it changed its name to Waikiki Beef and Grog. The menu stayed the same, but what they did now was to take out the partition between the bar and the restaurant and replace it with a curtain. And at 10 o'clock every night, the curtain was pulled back and the entire restaurant became a dance club because a live band would start playing. Why? Because that's what more younger people want. So Spetsglyph gives them what they want. And this again is a transition of the same business in the same location, adopting to what the clientele would respond to. In 1956, a hotel opened in Waikiki called the Waikikian, and it had this very dramatic lobby, as you can see, that's the first thing you saw from Alawana Boulevard, and it was designed by an architect named Pete Wimberly, and this very distinctive type of roof line is called a hyperbolic paraboloid. How does that sound? Well, as part of the Waikikian Hotel, 
Spence Cliff opened a restaurant in the hotel, which served as the hotel's dining room, but was also open to the public, and this was the Tahitian Lanai. And this depiction of it on the menu, which is very abstract, makes it look as dramatic as the paraboloid, hyperbolic paraboloid of the lobby. In fact, you didn't really see it like that. It never looked quite like this. But the Tahitian Lanai, as I said, was very popular with local residents, in addition to people who were staying at the hotel in Waikiki or a tourist from other parts of Waikiki. And it was located right next to the pool of the hotel. And then beyond the pool was the artificial lagoon that had been built for the uh, Hawaiian Village Hotel next door. So it was in a very attractive setting. It had originally supposed to have was supposed to originally have a Hawaiian motif, but Spencer Weaver had traveled to Tahiti. He saw a lot of Tahitian things for sale, souvenirs for sale. He bought a whole bunch of them, brought them back, and turned this new restaurant, when it was still in its formative stages, into a Tahitian-themed one. Uh, a lot of local people like to come here for Sunday brunch, and as did I, and you often had to wait in line to get in because it was so popular. Also in 1956, the opening of this restaurant, which is a 24-hour coffee shop called Tops, and I mentioned Tops earlier because it was my favorite place to go when I was a little boy in the late 1950s and early 60s. Tops was part of something which started in Southern California in Los Angeles, which was called, which was the 24-hour coffee shop in a very distinctive, modern, strikingly architecturally distinctive building. And this building style is called, by architectural historians, Googie. And there was one particular uh, architectural firm in Los Angeles that specialized in making Googie buildings. And Spence Weaver went to them, Armeyan Davis, and he designed, he had them design the same type of thing for us here in Honolulu. Spence really took a great deal of uh, pleasure in designing and planning this particular restaurant so that it was as efficient as possible. So everything in it was as modern, as up-to-date as could be for the time. And uh, look at that. That's a fabulous building. Well, what happened to that fabulous building? Why do you not see it anymore? Well, this is what happened to it. On the left is a photograph of Top's restaurant seen at the intersection of its location. It was located on the corner of Ina Road and Ala Moana Boulevard. And Top's only lasted for 20 years because of the pressures that Waikiki was undergoing to be intensively developed. And so in 1976, Top's closed, it was demolished, and it was replaced by Canterbury Place, which is the high-rise condominium, which you see in the picture on the right. And this is why you really cannot find evidence of most of the uh, former Spence Cliff restaurants because they're gone. Another 1950s thing that was popular in the United States was the tiki bar craze. In other words, the exotic uh, so forth. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more, but a really important uh, example of that was also built by Spence Cliff restaurants in the Windward City Shopping Center. Windward City Shopping Center opened in 1957. It was also very distinctively 1950s in its architectural style. And in the picture on the left, if you look in the background, there's the roof line of the main building, which has this really bizarre, interesting, wavy pattern. Tiki Tops was pretty much a replica of the previous Tops in Waikiki, but it had this famous tiki theme. And so in front of it was this huge carved tiki, hand carved by an artisan, and it uh, took several months to create. It was a three ton koa loa from Hawaii Island. And the bar attached to Tiki Tops was, as you can see, called Tiki Bar, which is just about as descriptive as you can make it. So, You've already seen some restaurants that Spencer Weaver took over from an existing one and turned it into something else. And he did that again in 1960. At the very busy intersection of Kapiolani Boulevard and Kalakaua Avenue, there was an existing drive-in restaurant that opened first in 1935 and then built a distinctive building in 1941. And that was called Kau Kau Corner. In 1960, Kau Kau Corner closed and was remodeled and turned into Coco's 
24-hour coffee shop, another 24-hour coffee shop run by Spence Cliff and really just blocks away from Tops, which already existed. So here is what happened. This at the top, you can see Cow Cow Corner in its original format, and it was a typical drive-in. You could go inside and eat at the counter, but most people chose to stay in their cars and be served by car hops. And that was going out of style. 24-hour coffee shops were coming into style, and that's what Spence Cliff did. Now, how it's amazingly, it, it's an amazing short time between when Cow Cow Corner closed in February 1960, and Coco's opened in the same location in September 1960. How was it possible to do this so quickly and to change so dramatically? Well, they did this in a very innovative way. On the left, you see the original 1941 Cow Cow Corner uh, building. And in order to remodel it and open a whole new restaurant there so quickly, they simply built around that existing building and just covered it up. And when it was demolished in 1986 with the construction of the first Hard Rock Cafe, underneath that roof was the intact Cow Cow Corner facade that you see in the picture on the right, which I took when the building was being demolished. They didn't even take off the sign. They just covered it up quickly. I don't, this was not something that Spence Weaver himself probably would have come up with. I'm sure Pete Wimberly, the architect, was the man who thought of it. But it shows you that Spence Cliff would support innovation and doing things in different ways in order to get them done well. Okay, another restaurant that got taken over was this one, Trader Vic's. Trader Vic's was the first, quote, South Seas restaurant to open in Honolulu in 1940. And interestingly, it was part of a chain of other Trader Vic's restaurants, but the original Trader Vic, who was from Oakland, California, got bought out by his local partner very quickly and then had no connection to this anymore. So Trader Vic's in Honolulu had nothing to do with the rest of the Trader Vic's restaurants in the chain. And it was a well-known chain, but only the people who owned it in Honolulu could use that phrase here. So here's a picture of Trader Vic's and its original uh, appearance in the early 1940s and a menu from the 1940s or 50s that shows you that. It went through one other owner, and then in 1967, Spence Weaver bought the lease for the building he bought the building and the lease for the property, he didn't own the property, and made Trader Vic's his own restaurant. And he said he bought it because of the fame of the name, because it was well known by a lot of Americans, and also because there was a lot of memorabilia inside the building. So here is a menu from after Spence Cliff had purchased Trader Vic's. However, just like with these other places, there was increasing pressure to develop this lot. And so in uh, the, about 1970, Spence Cliff moved Trader Vic's out of that old building and eventually sold it and moved to a new structure, which was constructed in the middle of, not in the middle of, but in the international marketplace right in Waikiki. So again, it's been moved to a place where there are a lot more people and you have a lot better chance of getting walk-in traffic simply because Waikiki is so crowded. So here's the second iteration of Spence Cliff's version of Trader Vic's. That was a very quick overview of just some of the Spence Cliff restaurants, by no means all of them. There probably were 50 or more in the total time that the company existed. What happened to it? Well, in 1986, the economy of Japan was booming. There was a tremendous amount of cash flowing around. And a lot of Japanese companies began purchasing property here and businesses here. And Spence Weaver at that point was 74 years old. And in 1985, he said, okay, I'm ready to sell. His brother Clifton had retired from the business a few years earlier or some years earlier, actually. And so he sold it to a Japanese company named Nitaku. Nitaku immediately didn't know what they were doing. They committed a lot of mistakes. And the first one was to turn one of the Spence Cliff restaurants called the Ranch House, located in Aina Haina, 
to rebuild it into a preposterously overdone complex of two restaurants, which was called, which were called Rockchilds and Metro. Rockchilds was a very expensive restaurant. Metro was supposed to be a version, a modern 1980s version of a 50s diner. And it, the plan was by Nitaku to turn all of the existing Spence Cliff restaurant, existing Spence Cliff coffee shops into metros. This opened in November of 1987. Immediately, everybody hated it. They hated the exterior. The exterior had been remodeled into this 1980s garish facade with neon on it. People vowed they would never go there. And in June of 1988, just months after opening, the whole thing shut down. Mitaku had spent $3 million on this. It had been budgeted for $1 million. They spent $3 million, and within months, they lost that entire investment. This is not successful. This is not a way to run a successful business. One of the very last remnants of Spence Cliff was this. This was the South Seas restaurant or restaurants because there were two different ones on the first floor and the second floor. And it was built in kind of a strange place on Nimitz Highway at Lagoon Drive, which is not a hotbed of fine dining. Um, but this distinctive building has a whole bunch of hand-carved and hand-made uh, materials incorporated into it, something you could not do today. This only lasted until 1985, at which point it was closed down and it became a car dealership. And it remained a car dealership until about June of this year, June of 2024. The last car dealership to occupy it to occupy it, moved out. And when I took the picture on the right in August, the building was still standing, although vandalized. I do not know at this time in September of 2024, whether South Seas building is still standing, but even if it is, it's not gonna be there for long. And this will probably be the end of every physical structure that housed a Spence Cliff restaurant. And that will be the last we'll see of it. I want to also mention that Spence Cliff did a very important thing in that it did not just serve alcohol and food. It also served as there were a number of Spence Cliff locations that had live performers, live musicians. There were discos with live performers. And Spence Cliff also opened and ran the Hawaiian Hut, which was a nightclub in the Al Moana Hotel that employed a number of musicians and performers as well. So they provided a lot of activity for a lot of local workers. So finally, here's a montage of some of the other Spence Cliff restaurants that I didn't talk about. Why did Spence Cliff go from such a successful business to a non-existent business? Well, here are, in as quickly as I can say them, some of the reasons I think this happened. One, Spence Weaver, I think, was so closely involved with everything in running these restaurants and in particular creating them, thinking of their titles, thinking of their themes, working on them. And in fact, he said that that was his, in an interview, he said that was the thing that gave him the most pleasure. And that's the thing that he liked the most, creating a new restaurant, starting a new restaurant, thinking of it, putting it together. Unfortunately, after it had been open for a while, he lost interest in it and maintenance and upkeep suffered for that reason. That's, a, that's one down thing. But the other thing is that there was so much his business, I think, without anybody else in succession to take it over, that once he was no longer involved, the main driving force was no longer there. And as I said too, the new buyers really dropped the ball in a number of ways. There are other reasons too. Um, the tasty, tastes changed. Um, the themes that were popular at some points gradually went out of popularity, but there wasn't anybody to step in and redo them the way Spence had been doing. But also running a chain of restaurants, each one of which was different, is a lot more complicated than running a chain of restaurants in which each one is identical, has the same menu, and doesn't have a lot of complexity. So fast food restaurants are the perfect example of that. Every McDonald's has the same stuff every Burger King, every Jack in the Box. But 
every Svenska restaurant was different. It had a different decor. It meant that everybody had different uniforms. It meant that every, they all had different menu, physical menus. And all the stuff that you were buying, all the food that you were buying, was different for each one of these. A lot of things were shared, but a lot of things were not. So that adds to the complexity of running a whole chain of restaurants. And they, I could go on and on, and I'm not going to, but I just want to point out, one, that I admire how Spence Restaurants was so successful, how much of an impact it made, how many people went to its restaurants, what a good name it built up for itself. Um, and I also want to say, too, that Spencecliff was famous for taking care of its employees. In 1952, they had started a profit-sharing plan in which I believe they probably just, if you agreed to it, took a deduction out of your paycheck and put it into an account for you. And after Nitaku took over and said that the company was no longer solvent, there were lawsuits by former Spencecliff employees against Nitaku for saying that they would no longer pay pensions and would no longer pay out of this fund into which the employees had paid. Um, Spencecliff also had a restaurant magazine for its employees called the Eat Beat, which had a column each issue, which came out every other month, about each one of the restaurants with names of a lot of the different employees. And so it was a way of getting a, a getting this you know, magazine and saying, look, my name is in this. Somebody cares about me. I'm somebody for this organization. They built up a lot of employee loyalty through things like this. Plus they got a discount to eat at the Spencer restaurants and a small thing, but it makes sense. You got your birthday off every year. You didn't have to work. And you got a free birthday cake because Spencecliff also ran bakeries that made food for the restaurants. So fond memories of Spencecliff, sad that it's no longer with us, lessons of both good and bad of how to run a business in ways that will be successful, but also in things that you need to be careful about. That brings us to the end of this episode of How Did We Get Here? Here on Think Tech Hawaii. I am the host, DeSoto Brown. Thank you for joining me. I hope to be seeing you in the future uh, for other Think Tech shows like this one. Until then, everybody, aloha.